Sorry. So today we're going to talk about getting your farm ready for calving, some common management techniques that are going to help you start out successfully, and then of course we're going to talk about when things go wrong. So these are questions you need to ask yourself when you're getting your farm ready for calving. What are the facilities you're going to do? Have you designated a calving area, whether inside or outside? Do you have the equipment to carefully handle these animals? Do you have a shoot or a head gate? If you can't catch these animals in a safe manner, it's going to be dangerous for you and it's going to be dangerous for them. What kind of calving equipment do you have ready? Do you have a specific calving kit? And I'll go over what should be in that calving kit. And finally, what personnel? Who is helping you? Who's your vet? Um, who's going to be helping you throughout this season? All right, so when you're designating a calving area, you want to try to plan ahead as much as possible. Now, we don't always know what the weather is going to be like, but sometimes we have the general idea. For example, up north where I grew up in Wisconsin, we know that winter is going to be cold. We know there's going to be snow cover. So when there's snow cover or heavy winds, we will calve indoors. We have indoor facilities where we'll calve. You want your areas to be clean and dry and limit contamination from any kind of bacteria. If you're going to calve outside, which is great, you want to have a smaller pasture closer to your house and your barn. And why you want this is not only a smaller pasture allows you to keep a better eye on your animals, because these cows and heifers generally like to calve alone, so they'll find the farthest reaches of those pastures to calve at. All right. If you calve close to your house, you can keep a better eye on them more often. And if something were to go wrong, the closer that pasture is to your barn, the easier it is to get them into that handling facility you have if you have to intervene. If you're calving inside, you want to make sure that they're sheltered from the elements. So we're talking three-sided buildings. Two-sided buildings can, if the wind's blowing the right way, create a heck of a wind tunnel, which isn't good for the cow and it sure as heck isn't good for the calf. All right, so you want a roof and three sides. You also want to make sure that you have multiple, you have space for multiple cows and heifers to calve at one time. No matter how well you plan, they're not going to generally calve on the date you want them to. And you want to make sure that you can calve them in individual pens. It's a real pain when cows claim calves that aren't theirs, especially if they haven't calved yet. You don't want to deal with mix-ups or potential orphan calves. And always, always, always try to have a head catch or a shoot to safely handle these animals. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and buy this big, bad, expensive chute. If you have a head catch, you can design your own chute with materials you might have on hand, with lumber or steel. Okay? When you calve indoors, it's crucial that you have good bedding and you have enough bedding that allows that calf to dry off quickly and stay warm. Okay, these are just a few examples of nice layouts on having lots of space and lots of bedding. The only thing I would add to these is at the bottom rungs of those gates, I would put some plywood sides because sometimes calves like to stick their heads through and you don't want a mama cow charging a calf that's not hers. One of those pet peeves that we deal with in the industry, no matter what time we calve, whether it's fall or spring, is mud. Mud is a real problem when you're calving. To, in order to know if your calves are doing okay during a spring muddy season is see how fluffy their hair is. Fluffy hair indicates you've got, your calves are doing fine and they're staying warm. What I mean by that is when your hair is really fluffy, there's actually air particles that form an insulating layer around these hair. So when it rains, it actually, flattens the hair and it removes that insulating layer so your calf gets chilled. That hair will dry though and the calf will be fine. What happens with mud is mud cakes on that calf and it mats the hair down. So that way that calf can't warm up because it's lost that insulating layer. If the sun comes out, that's one thing, but you still have that matted hair that causes that calf to stay chilled. So you wanna provide a drier place dry, cleaner place for these calves to rest at. That mud also carries bacteria and pathogens. Number one and number two way that calves pick up these pathogens 
that cause scours is through the cow's udder. If she's got to wade through deep mud or she's laying in a lot of mud, the calves will get it off the udder. And they're going to also pick it up if they're calving out in the mud through their navel before it dries off and closes up. Nobody wants to deal with scours and bacterial pneumonia because of mud. Another big player about mud, and you'll know this too when you're walking through it and you're trudging through that mud, is the amount of energy it takes to move into this mud. You're going to have a decrease of feed intake on these animals because they're moving less and it's requiring more energy to move, so they're not going to do it. If they have to walk a far way to get feed, they're just not going to do it. So it helps to have cleaner pastures they can go to. You can put some straw down in some bedded areas to give them a break. And it also is nice if possible to have kind of a dry lot setting for them to eat. For example, up north at my family's place, we have a cow yard that's part sandstone shale rock crushed and a concrete pad. It gives the cows a break from any mud that we get in the spring pastures, especially from the winter thaws. And it gives them a chance to go somewhere they can eat that's dry, that has good footing underneath them and gives them a break. We also have our waterers up there and we're able to clean out any excess mud so we don't have a buildup of, of mud and manure. Also keep in mind that these new lactating cows need an increased amount of energy to begin with. This is crucial that you're upping your feed during the muddy season so that way you're not losing ground on body condition and so you're not losing time on them later when you go to breed them back. Another great way to help get them some bedding outside is if you feed in round bale feeders, don't make them clean up all the hay. Leave a little bit at the bottom and as you move your round bale feeder around the pasture to give them a break from the mud, spread out some of that hay and it'll give the calves and the cows a dry place to lay. One thing to worry about, not so much here, more so on the western part of the state, not on the eastern part where I live, is wind chill. Keep in mind what the true temperature is with the wind out there, especially if you're calving on days where it's going to get particularly chilly. Not that we get wind chills here in the minus 40s like we do up north, but it's still something to be very aware of when you're calving. If you're going to have a particularly windy cold day, if there's somewhere and you know a cow is going to calve, if there's somewhere you can bring her that'll be sheltered from it, you should absolutely do it. With that in mind, sometimes we can't help it and cows have calves in situations and places we really wish they wouldn't. And if you have to warm a newborn calf, it's important to know that their body temperature should be between 101 and 102 degrees Fahrenheit. We consider anything over 100, anything below 100 to be starting in stages of hypothermia and you need to get them warmed up. There are several different ways to do it. Some ways are a little bit more efficient and easier than others. Uh, for example, putting them on the floorboards, the front of a pickup that you might have an old farm truck. That's a really good method. It's just gonna take you a while. You wanna warm them up slow. Nothing, none of these methods you're warming up is fast. So you wanna warm them up a little slow. It's gonna take you about an hour running, them, running your truck. You can also take them inside, whether you wanna bring them into a mud room, if you got a heated shop, your barn or shop with heat lamps, just keep in mind when that animal starts moving around, heat lamps can get knocked over and be a fire hazard. So always, always have someone with that calf if you have it near heat lamps. Also remember to completely dry off that calf before you wrap it in blankets. You can use towels, hair dryer, whatever you need to do. Because if you wrap up a wet calf with blankets, you're actually going to have to, they're going to have to try to use their energy to, to dry themselves off and warm up that, in that warmed up blanket. They don't have that energy to spare. So do them a favor and dry them off first. Another way is a hot box. So the blue one's actually a commercial type hot box. You can also make your own. The key is to have a fan that circulates that warm air where you can, they'll be able to dry off. Once that calf is dried off and standing and moving around, you can take them out of the hot box, get some fluids in them, they're gonna be all right. If you want to, wrap them in blankets and keep them in your shop overnight. The final method is a little bit trickier. It's where you warm them up in your bathtub, warm water immersion. This one's 
pretty slow process and you got to take it slow. You got to use warm water, not hot. I'm talking warm water. And you slowly keep adding warm water to your tub as you're warming this calf back up. Okay. If you add them into hot water, it's going to cause cold shock and heart failure. So it's got to be warm water that you slowly add over time. So that's probably going to be your longest method. Once that calf's warm, take it out of the tub. You're going to have to dry it off with towels or a hair dryer and get some fluid in it again. So it's a little bit longer method, but it still works. Oh, and if you have a hot tub, please don't put them in your hot tub. It's a terrible idea. It's too hot. All right, one of the things you do have to worry about here more than other parts of the country is the heat index. You have really high humidity summers here. And if you're calving a little bit later in the spring, more towards the summer when we start to get those higher temperatures and then a higher heat, higher humidity, you need to be aware of how that affects your cows. It can be very stressful to calve when it's really hot. If you have areas where they have shade, great. Um, sometimes if you have kind of a bank barn situation with cinder block walls or rock walls that provide a little bit cooler shaded area, if you're having a particularly hot day, it's okay to bring them inside and let them calve somewhere where it's cooler. It can, it can be really hard on them and really exhausting to calve in this kind of heat. You really got to watch them in heat just as closely as you have to watch them in the cold. Now, developing your own calving kit. You want to make sure that you have a method of identification, whether it's ear tag, tagger, um, something that's going to ID that particular calf, halter and a rope, um, disposable OB or breeding sleeves, those big long gloves that we use for AI, disposable milking style gloves. I like to put those over the sleeve because the sleeves don't really fit my hands. They're a little too big. Two stainless steel buckets. Um, you might have plastic sitting around, but you really don't want to use them because they could have cracks in them that you don't see and other holes. So you take the time to fill them for hot water and all it drains out anyway. So stick with stainless steel. You want to have lube, plenty of it. Like to keep a, ga a gallon on hand. Disinfectants such as Novasan and Chlorhexidine. I don't recommend dish soap as much because it gets really sudsy. So you have to be careful if you're going to use dish soap that it's not too sudsy. Clean OB chains and you know nylon calf strap. So once you use your chains, you want to make sure that you dry them for the season. So hang them up to dry before you put them away so they don't get rusted. If there's any kind of rust on them, get new ones. Otherwise, just switch to using calf strap. It's a really great device. We'll talk about it on our next talk. If you want to have flashlights with extra batteries, keep in mind that batteries do tend to drain faster as it gets cold. What I like to do when I use flashlights with removable batteries is flip a battery. So that way if the flashlight accidentally turns on, it won't run and run its batteries down. Okay. Iodine for dipping the calf's navel. A bottle with a lamb nipple, and that's not a typing error. I do mean a lamb nipple. If you've ever seen a calf nipple, they're really hard and sometimes they can be tough for the calf to use. So if you start them with a lamb nipple, which is a little bit more pliable and easy to use. Um, it's much, much easier for the calf to get started on that, especially since, you know, they're pretty new at this whole drinking thing. Okay, you wanna have a stomach tube feeder. I recommend this style because it has a detachable top. You want an alarm clock with extra batteries. Don't rely on your cell phone to be your only source of alarm, especially if you have a cow that's close and you wanna check her every hour. Don't rely on your cell phone, get an alarm clock. And then you want towels and a hair dryer, just in case you need to dry that calf off. Um, you can find a lot of these supplies at your local farm supply stores, tractor supplies, you know, southern states. I like to order my stuff from Valley Vet. Um, the shipping's a little pricey, but it, they get it to you really fast. So that's always nice. Now for personnel. It's really important that you have a relationship with your vet and you know who your vet is and he's he or she have been out to your farm before you start calving so they know where your barn is they know how to get into your barn because if you're calling them in on an emergency odds are you're back in the handling facility dealing with that cat that cow calving and they're going to meet you back there so they need to know where they're going okay i know some areas of of the country have a hard time finding a large animal vet. Um, so, I mean, 
you got to do the best you can. And I'm going to help you mitigate some of those things. But if you do have a vet, please keep their number handy. What I mean is literally writing it out, keeping it taped to the toolbox you have your kit in or the tote you have your kit in. Don't rely on your cell phone to pull that number out. I mean, we've all had farming accidents with cell phones. Um, if that cell phone, you know, gets dropped or, you know, damaged and you can't get into that number, you're toast. So write it out, put it on your calving kit. I like to write it out and then put tape over it so it's spared from the elements. Keep it handy, is what I'm saying. You can never have it in too many places. It's an important number. Know who's going to help you calve. If you have somebody who's new to this, do they know where you keep your calving supplies? And more importantly, do they know how to use them? So if you're having your neighbor check into your cow, check in on your cows for you while you're at work, if something happens, do they have a way of helping you? Do they know where your supplies are and they know how to use them? Are they familiar with your farm setup? Do they know um, how to move animals from your calving area into your handling facilities, what gates they need to open or close? Get them familiar with your farm. And another important thing is, do your cattle know them? Anyone who's ever gone to a farm and tried to work cattle that don't know you, it's really hard. Cows are creatures of habit and they don't like change. So particularly during calving, it's not the best time to introduce new people to help you. Okay, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty stressful for your cows and let alone the person who's not going to get those cows to go where he wants them to. Okay, Great, so... What does it mean to have a successful calving? So this talk, this section, we're going to talk about strictly what 100% normal is. So when all things go right. Um, so we're going to tell you about the three stages of labor. What are some tips that I recommend? And then your number one tool in your calving toolbox should be patience. Um, so anyone out here who has small children, they probably took their time to get here. Labor was not quick. It's the same with cattle. These things take time and a little bit of patience. So what normal calving means, so when everything goes well, everything goes right, and you don't have to intervene, it can take up to 20 hours. So on the, on the low end, it's about four hours. On the high end, it's about 20 hours. That's a really long time. That's why patience is really important. The first stage, you won't always be aware of it, um, the first stage is when that calf is getting positioned correctly into the birthing canal. So it's starting to head the feet and, the, and, and its nose up towards the cervix. So that's what's going on in stage one. You're not really, you're seeing some outside physical effects on the cow, but it's just a lot of internal, the calf getting ready. Stage two is actual delivery of that calf from the beginning to the end. And then the third stage, just as important as the first two, is where we have you know, the, the expulsion of the placenta. So after the placenta has been dropped, we are considered done with calving for that animal. All right, as I stated in the preparatory phase, there's a lot going on on the inside of that cow. So what starts labor actually is the stress hormone in the calf. So the calf is who dictates when they're gonna be born. They emit a stress signal to mom, and then mom starts having contractions, and we start getting dilation of the cervix and, and this whole process that takes place inside. But what you're seeing outside is, is, you know, she's starting to show signs of discomfort. She's restless. She's arching her back. She's straining. She's just really uncomfortable, okay? Sometimes she's even kicking at her belly because, you know, baby's moving around a lot. She's, what we mean by fully alert is she's aware of what's going on around her. She, you know, she's probably still chewing her cud. She's eating a little bit. She's drinking. She's behaving what we consider normal, just, you know, uncomfortable and a little annoyed. We consider entering stage two of labor when we see that water bag. Okay, so when you start to see the beginning of the water bag and it starts, you know, the expulsion of it, that's now we're into stage two. So that's when we kind of start our mental clock. And with stage two, this is this is where in a normal situation, you know, it can be 30 to 60 minutes in a, in a cow who's done this before and has a calving yeast calf, or it can be anywhere for an hour to four hours for a heifer. You just want to keep an eye on the clock. 
Again, in a normal delivery, which is what we're going to talk about right now is normal, you know, that calf is putting pressure on the birth canal and it keeps dilating. All right. And we're starting to physically see contractions in her ribs. You know, we can really see her pushing um, and she'll eventually lay down. We like that when they lay down, we're like, okay, now, now this is going to get real. You want the front feet first, but you want to see the tops of the feet. If you see the soles of the feet, that's a problem. So remember, this is normal. So they're going to come out feet first. That nose is going to come out between the legs. But while you're seeing the feet and you're starting to see a little bit more, you got the toes, and then you move on to the fetlock joints, what's going to happen is there's a slight pause. And there's usually always a pause here because things are continuing to dilate. Things are continuing to stretch to make room for this calf to come out. This is normal. It is absolutely normal to have her pause. She's, she's going to take a little break from contractions while things are still beginning to stretch out, but there is a normal pause here. It's a couple minutes. Okay, don't worry. So this, this tends to be a time where people start to want to jump in and help her. Everything's going fine so far. All right, so then we start to see the nose come out, the rest of her head, the shoulders, the chest. And now as the chest is coming out, you're starting to see some mucus that might be coming out of the calf. It might be starting to shake its head a little, you know, snort a little because it's trying to clear out its um, nasal passages and its lungs. And then the rest of the calf comes out. Okay. Again, this can be a lengthy process. It can take a, a little over, you know, one to four hours for heifers and that 60 minutes to a couple hours for cows, depending on the size of the calf and how experienced they are. Now, at this point, we've got a calf on the ground and we've got a mom laying. What we want to do is we want mom to, to stand up, turn around, and start cleaning her calf off. And we'd really like her to start doing that within about 10 minutes of giving birth. Okay. At this point, when she starts licking that calf off, it's going to start initiating that calf to start wanting to stand up. And it should be working on standing, kind of wobbling on those um, back legs, then trying to get the front legs up about 20 to 30 minutes after and it's really important that you stick around and watch if you can and make sure that calf starts nursing in those first 60 minutes. That's really important. And our final stage is where we have the placenta gets expulsed. So what's really great about having that calf get up and start nursing is when the calf starts nursing, it sends signals to the mom's brain to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that allows her to let down more milk, but it also helps stimulate more contractions to help remove the placenta. So it's kind of stuck in there like Velcro, but we have, you know, caruncles and cotyledons, but it, it's like Velcro. And so we want them to detach and then the placenta can come out. We don't consider anything under 12 hours to be retained and that you need to interfere, okay? Um, the reason why it could take longer sometimes is because um, she's tired, especially if she's she's hot. She's tired, it's gonna take a little longer. Body just needs a break. Um, sometimes because she had twins or if it was a little bit more of a difficult delivery, it's gonna take a little longer for her to, to you know, drop her placenta. But that's a normal situation. Here, um, some calving tips. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the, the Conefull method. It's named after um, rancher Gus Conefull. He, he learned through uh, practice that if he fed his cows at dusk, so between 4 and 6 p.m., majority of his calves are born during the day. Now, Iowa State and Kansas State University have taken that and done research over many years, and they've come to the same conclusion that if you feed at dusk, a large majority of your calves will be during, born during the day. What we don't know right now is why that works. We're, we're not sure what the physiology is of why it works. We just know that it does. So if you're not necessarily supplementing, but you're feeding hay, try to feed your hay later in the day. I know you wanna have free choice amount of hay out all day. You don't want them to go without feed, um, but try to push majority of your feeding towards afternoon. So that way the majority of the feed they're actually intaking or eating is gonna be that four to 6 p.m. and they'll just munch on it all throughout the day. Um, otherwise, if you do any kind of supplementing feed, uh, for example, up north, we feed corn silage every day. We feed it between, you know, 3 o'clock, 3.30 and 5.30 is when we feed silage every day. 
Okay, you also want to maintain detailed calving records. The more information you have on your cows, the better. You know, you need to know what's normal for each animal. For example, maybe you have a cow that you just know when she calves, she has it quick. You know, she has that calf in under an hour. So for her to take more than an hour, hour and a half, that's unusual for her and you would want to investigate that. Okay, and check out, make sure she's doing okay. Um, also, if you have a cow who normally calves early and she calves late for some reason, you don't, you'd want to look into that a little bit more too because it's not normal for her. And you also want to make sure that everything's ready to go. Think of it as Murphy's Law. The more prepared you are, the less likely you are to need to use it. And again, our last and most important tool is patience. So we want to make sure that we're patient with these animals, okay? Things, things take time. Okay, so one of the things to know about calving, and if you have any experience with it and you've been doing it a long time, you know that it's not a matter of if things go wrong, it's, it's a matter of when. You know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Most of the time they go right, but there are times when things go wrong. We're going to talk about things that can go wrong before calving. So that's what prepartum is. We're going to talk about dystocia, which is just a really fancy word for saying calving difficulties. Why they happen, you know, when you need to step in, and then how to use some tools. We're going to talk about postpartum issues. So things that can happen right after giving birth for mom. And we're going to talk about postnatal issues. So things that happen, you know, that can happen with the calf after birth. So one of the really big issues that happens prepartum is a vaginal prolapse. So what happens is the vagina pushes itself out ahead of everything else. This is a really common condition that I've seen in show heifers that are carrying way too much condition as they get closer to calving. Um, is I'm sure many of you have seen this where they're laying down and they're really, really pregnant. So sometimes when cows are really, really pregnant, we're talking two weeks out from calving, there's a lot of pressure. And when they lay down, you see a little bit of pink tissue. If she stands up and you don't see that pink tissue anymore, that's not anything you need to be concerned about. That just happens because of the pressure of them being so pregnant. When you need to be concerned is when they stand back up and it's and the tissue is still protruding and it's still there. Um, then that is then it's a cause for concern because as that tissue is exposed to the elements, the outside world where it's not normally, um, you can have the tissue can pick up bacteria, infections, it can dry out. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. When things like this happen and it doesn't resolve itself with her standing up, you need to contact your veterinarian. So what they do is they actually um, put the vagina back in place and then stitch her shut until she calves. And now you have to keep a really close eye on her because you have to cut the stitches that they put in. It's a really good idea to have good records so when something like this happens, you can call that cow because if she's done it once, she will more than likely do it again. Uh, there's a there can be a genetic link to it or a hereditary link to it. So if she has a heifer calf, I wouldn't recommend keeping that one because that calf could have that same issue down the road. You might also find that it's a line of cattle that are doing that who all have the same sire. And that's why it's also important to keep records. So if you're finding this problem, eliminating that genetic line from your herd will help you um, prevent this problem in the future. Unfortunately, it's actually a pretty common issue in Hereford, Simmentals, and Charlays, particularly as a breed. So that's something to keep in mind if you're raising those cattle. You just had a higher incidence of it. So something to watch for. Dystocia. So dystocia, again, it's just a fancy word for saying, you know, difficult or delayed birth. It's fairly common in the U.S. And most of the time, it's because of large calves and um, compared to the size of the cow. So you're having heavy birth weights and you're and it's not a, a calving yeast issue. Um, another way is that the nutrition, so if you're pouring a lot of grain on these cows or putting a lot of feed into them, 
when they're in the growth stage of their calves, you can get larger calves. So just watch how much you're pouring the grain to them. Keep an eye on them. You want to make sure that when you're breeding your smaller first calf heifers and second calf heifers, that you're really being careful with calving ease. I know things happen and, and sometimes you think you have calving ease and, and you get a train wreck and it's just not. It happens. Um, and then also one of the very common ways we have dystocia is, you know, what we mean by fetal position is, is they were coming out wrong, their breech. Whether they're back legs first or one leg forward, one leg back, or their heads back, these are all problems where we get dystocia. All right, so one question I always get is, well, when do I intervene? When do I need to step in and help? Particularly if you've lost a calf in the future, you're going to feel more likely that you need to help all the time because if only you would help that time, that calf wouldn't have died. You should have been there. You need to stop beating yourself up, first off. You don't know if, if you could have saved it. There might be times where that calf was just a stillborn and there was nothing you could do. Um, each new calving experience is a lesson that you get to teach yourself. Um, but more importantly, don't beat yourself up too hard, okay? When it comes to intervening, we wanna make sure that we're not intervening too soon. So I had experience with folks where they had really hard pulls and more times than not, it was because she wasn't fully dilated yet. So you wanna make sure that she's dilated before you start pulling. And I'm gonna teach you how to do that, okay? A couple of scenarios of where you wanna step in. So let's say, for example, you know, you have a cow or a heifer off by herself and she's restless for six to eight hours and you don't have, um, you, you don't have visible signs of labor. So what that means is you've been watching her for six to eight hours and there's no water bag and you're not sure um, if she's progressing at all. You want to bring her in and check her out. So what might be happening is she's either having an issue with dilation, so her body's not letting her cervix dilate, and that could be because the calf's too big and it's not able to travel into the birth canal appropriately to trigger her body to dilate, or it's abnormal presentation. It's not feet first. Maybe she's coming tail first, where it's not, again, able to do the pressure points to get the cervix to dilate. Another scenario is that the cow and heifer have been, you know, cow or heifer has been straining hard for more than an hour and there's either no sign of the calf showing or um, every time she pushes, you see his feet, but then when she stops, they suck back in. I think those of us who've done calving enough have seen this before, where those, cow, those toes peek out and you're like, all right, she's making progress and then stops and they slide back in. So what's going on there? It can be several things. You could be having, you know, an issue with calf size where that calf's too big to get any farther into the birth canal. You can be having fatigue on the part of the cow or the heifer, or it could simply be an issue of presentation. So you can't see the head because it's bent back. So if the calf's head is bent back, it can't travel any further into the birth canal. Third scenario is where if you have a yellow brown fluid, we call that muconium. And it's present in the amniotic sac and um, or around on the tissue of the calf or its hide or um, in the discharge. And so what's happening there is that the calf has actually had a bowel movement in utero. And when they do that, it's because they're under extreme amount of stress. And so when they're under stress like that, you really need to get that calf out as soon as possible. This is an emergency situation. And they can be stressed for any number of reasons. Um, another scenario is if the feet are upside down, so you're seeing those soles of their feet. Um, it could be because they're upside down or they're backwards. And so that's also an emergency scenario because as the calf travels through the birth canal, its source of oxygen is its umbilical cord. Now, if they're coming out normally, the umbilical cord getting crushed between the pelvis of the cow and the calf's body isn't a problem because their head's outside so they can take a big old deep breath. If they're coming backward, when that umbilical cord is, in, is getting pinched off between the calf's body and the mom's pelvis, that calf's head 
is still down in the amniotic fluid. So when that gets pinched and that calf goes to take a big old breath, they're gonna take in amniotic fluid and drown. Okay, so if they're coming backwards, you wanna make sure that you get in there and you help pull and you do it rather quickly. Okay, and then a final scenario that is, we go over is if a calf's, you know, the birthing process is halted altogether. There's no more forward progress. There, there has been no change. And we like to document that by, you know, nothing's happened in the last, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. There's been no progress. So what's happening there is that usually it's the calf's just a bit too big to come out without help, or mom's just really tired. Now there's this old wives' tale, and I, I wish it would go away. It's saying that if you, there's a saying that if you help a heifer um, calve the first time, if you pull that calf for her, she'll be lazy the rest of her life. That's not true. You should never make an animal struggle, especially giving birth, because what's gonna happen, especially for your first calf heifers, if you make them work really, really hard to the point of exhaustion, they're gonna be behind for the rest of their productive years for you. They'll always be behind the curve. They'll breed back slower. They're just always gonna be behind, right? She's having a calf because of, of you know, the farm that she's on. When you bred her or you put her with a bull, so it's your responsibility to make sure that she has a successful calving experience and she doesn't work to the point of extreme exhaustion. Here's some examples of some, abnormal presentations. So there are ways that you can get that calf out on your own. Um, but one thing to really keep in mind is while that calf is in mom, in the uterus, it has an intact umbilical cord. So when you're manipulating different limbs to get them forward, to get them towards the birth canal, for example, um, the shoulder, when you have an arm, a leg back, the shoulder flex on, you wanna make sure that that leg isn't wrapped around the umbilical cord. Cause if you go to pull that leg forward and you snap that umbilical cord, you're gonna cause yourself more problems. So you can manipulate these calves and get them out without a vet. Just be aware of where the umbilical cord is. And it is a lot of work to, with some of these, for example, you know, the head back or, you know, transverse presentation. It's just gonna require some tools. And we're gonna move on into what I mean by these tools on our next slide. So, well, two slides actually. So when I told you before that I'm gonna teach you how to, to check and see if an animal's dilated, it's a pelvic exam, okay? So you're gonna perform a pelvic exam on your animals to determine what's going on. That way also when you're calling your vet, you can give them the information they're going to need to whether they can talk you through on the phone how to do it or whether like I'm on my way here's what I need you to do. You need to start by having your equipment ready. So you need to start with clean hot water in your two buckets. One bucket should be clean hot water without soap and one should have your disinfectant. You need lube, plenty of lube. Take the whole gallon jug. You want paper towels not regular cloth towels because it's easy to just use them once and get rid of them. When you keep using, reusing a cloth towel and trying to find the clean parts, you can introduce new bacteria, okay? You wanna use your calving chains, again, or your calf strap. I like to keep them in the hot water with the disinfectant so I make sure that they stay clean because they're gonna be really in on the action, okay? You wanna have your handles if you use cal if you use chains. I prefer the ones with the neoprene um, anti-slip grip because things are gonna get really slippery. You wanna have plastic sleeves, so those breeding sleeves and disposable gloves. Now, the reason you wanna wear the long breeder's gloves is because you can actually have an allergy to the amniotic fluid in cows. I don't personally have an allergy, but I have a coworker in Nebraska who does. And the only way they found out they had an allergy was by delivering a calf and it turned out to be a pretty painful rash. Um, so if you don't know whether you have an allergy or not, wear some breeding gloves. I also like to wear disposable gloves over it. You wanna restrain that cow in a head shoot or your shoot, and then you wanna completely clean her back end. Now, as in all things, she will probably poop on you once or twice while you're cleaning, but just make sure you clean it as best as possible. 
you want to use the hot, you know, the soapy water, the disinfectant, and then you want to rinse it. It's really important. The rinsing is really important. Soap is an irritant and causes inflammation, and you don't need any more inflammation in the back end than you already are going to have. Okay. And then you have to wash yourself up. So you could be introducing bacteria. You and anybody who helps you, wash up your arms, get some gloves on, and then you start your pelvic exam. Really lube it up. I like to use, um, reuse those reusable catch for mustard squirt bottles. Helps you really get lube all over your arms. You can never have enough lube. You just can't, okay? So you're gonna determine how dilated the cervix is. Okay, so how you're gonna do that can be challenging if there's a calf in the way. You're gonna reach in along the sides of the pelvis and you're gonna feel how much pressure it takes for you to feel the pelvic bone lets you know how dilated she is or isn't. Okay, you can manually dilate a cow. It's gonna take a little bit of time. So what you do to manually dilate a cow is you're gonna get your hands on the, the tissue of, of the vulva and you're gonna just press, put pressure on it for about 10 seconds and then hold off and put pressure on it for about 10 seconds and hold off. It's this, it, you're mimicking the same um, pressure that a calf would provide as it was traveling through the birth canal, which is how you expand and dilate the cervix to begin with. It's going to take a little bit of time, but you can do it. Now you're going to check and see what the position of the calf is. Is it normal? Is it coming normal and that calf's just big? Or do you have an abnormal presentation where you need to manipulate that calf? Again, size. Is the calf large? Is the pelvis small? What's going on as far as where's the mismatch? And is there enough lubrication? Sometimes if she's been pushing and straining a lot, things start to get a little dry. And so that hair tends to rub, especially if the calf's coming the wrong way, you're going against the grain and it can be really hard. Sometimes she just needs a whole lot of extra lube in there. One thing again to remember, don't ever use soap. I realize soap is slippery to the touch, but soap is a major, major source of inflammation and irritation. And that we're already dealing with a lot of swelling going on to begin with. So stay away from soap, lube only. And if you need to, Vaseline, it's just a little harder to deal with because it's thicker. And then you need to call your vet and let them know what's going on if you can't remedy the situation on your own. All right, calving aids. Normally this is where I actually show them up and show you how to use them, but I can't do that today. So when you buy your calving aids, something like this, calf strap, how you use it is you just push in the tip and you form a loop, okay? You put that loop on the calf joint and you can pull one for each side, okay? I grew up using chains and I kind of prefer chains. I do like straps. This is actually really handy to use, but I did grow up with chains and I was trained on chains. So you can actually get one chain for each side and I can show you how to wrap them in a little bit. If you're someone who has chains and you have handles, but you think you want to try calf straps, I highly recommend this style of strap, which is the green one. It has the chains in the middle, so you can still hook your individual handles to it to pull. So there's many different methods. There's also a large calf strap that they make that you can actually wrap it around your body if you're a bit taller person than me, and you can use your body as kind of a fulcrum to help you pull that calf. All right, how to with these OB chains. If you're using chains and you're only wrapping them once, you are playing a risky game. So what happens when you only wrap your chain once? You may have gotten lucky so far, not had any issues, but if you're only wrapping them once and you're putting that wrap on the front half of the dew claws right before the hoof, you risk stripping that hoof of that bone structure. Okay, we don't want to do that. That's a real problem. And if you're only using a one wrap and you're putting it behind the dew claws and the fetlock joint, you could break the leg. Okay, or chip the joint. So we want to make sure that you're putting two wraps on because that two wraps helps you spread out the pressure and the force from that pull. Now, if you will notice from the image, the half hitch or the loop in the chain is on the top of the joint. And this is because when you pull, that joint's gonna bend and you want it to bend with the joint, nat the natural bend of the joint, okay? So when the hoof goes down, when you pull, you won't hurt the joint, right? 
Ah, the polling part. This is the part where we all hope we don't really have to do it. Um, you want to attach your calf straps or a chain, one to each side. Okay. Now, it's really important when you pull is where you want to do a method where we walk that calf out. To have this make sense, usually I show you walking, but just think of it this way. When you're, when you're physically walking, you're moving one foot at a time. Okay. You don't move both feet or you fall down. So think of it as when you're walking and as you're pulling, you're pulling one leg at a time and you're alternating your pulls, okay? This is important because it helps you get the shoulders through the pelvis. I've seen situations where folks bear down and they pull and what happens is they jam the shoulders in the pelvis, okay? You can fix this. It's just gonna take a little bit of work. We call that shoulder lock. So when the shoulders lock in the pelvis, it's gonna take a little bit of force to fix. All right, as she's pushing that calf out, which is gonna make things harder, and this is a two person job, you're, one person's gonna take and push one shoulder in while the other person pulls the other shoulder out. So you're gonna twist the shoulders, okay? And that's gonna mimic that walking out thing. All right, so you're gonna pop one shoulder out of the pelvis and then pop the other one back out and then go back to your alternating. You're always gonna be alternating. All right, if you're doing it on your own, it's a really great ab workout where you just keep twisting, All right? When you pull one side, you're gonna maintain tension, pull the other side to equal, okay? And then just keep walking it out while you're doing it. The key to make it easier for you and her is to make sure that you're pulling when she's pushing. Don't make more work for you if you can help it and don't make it harder on her. So every time she pushes, you should be pulling. All right, so you wanna make sure that you keep things really lubricated while you're doing this. Now, we've gotten to the chest, great. All things considered, it's going well. And this is, again, if the calf's coming forward. Now we wanna turn that calf's body and we wanna rotate it about 45 degrees. So that way that calf's pelvis is traveling through the widest part of the cow's pelvis, All right? This is another situation where we can have issues with hip lock. And so I've noticed many times when people have a really hard pull and they end up pinching a nerve in some of their cows, it's because usually they had a situation with hip lock in that calf. And you're gonna fix hip lock almost the exact way you're gonna fix shoulder lock, okay? You're gonna have to push back on that calf while she's trying to push it out, which is gonna be really hard. And then you're gonna have to turn that calf a little bit more because your problem might be not quite having the right angle. And then again, you're gonna walk it out one side of the hip and the other. It's just gonna be alternating the whole time until you get that calf out. Now, I know you guys are gonna ask me about calf pullers and come-alongs. When used appropriately, I think they're great tools for helping you maintain tension. More times than not though, they're not used correctly and it's, it's harmful and dangerous for the cow and the calf. You should never be using come-alongs and calf jacks to ratchet the calf out. They should never be used as a pulling device. They should only be used to help you maintain tension, especially if you've got a tough pull and you're doing it on your own. If you set a come-along to maintain tension for you, you pull one side so you get, gain a little ground, tighten your tension. Pull the other side, tighten your tension. That's how you can use a come along or a calf jack, but they should never be used to ratchet that calf out. You'll be putting a lot, a lot of pressure on that calf and that cow's pelvis, which is a really bad idea. All right, so now let's talk about things that can go wrong after the calf's been born. And a retained placenta can happen even in a normal delivery where nothing went wrong and you didn't have to intervene. This just means that, you know, it just didn't let go. It's, it, the thing we look out for is infections that can happen in the uterus, which can delay rebreeding. But what we don't want you to do is to pull on that placenta. What that does, where you're trying to forcefully extract it and pull apart those, those Velcro-like connections, it actually causes pretty extensive scarring in the uterus and that can really, really affect rebreeding. Okay, I think there was one skipped, no. 
Ah, the next one, uterine prolapse. So just like the vaginal prolapse, it's where a t your, your inside tissue ends up on the outside. And a uterine prolapse happens a little differently than a vaginal prolapse. It's not a, a really a heritable thing. It's a, it's a condition that happens because of either a really difficult uh, delivery or where the calf was pulled wrong. What I mean by is where you used to come along your calf puller and you ratcheted that calf out and you pulled it really fast. You can create a partial vacuum and that uterus will come with that calf. So what needs to happen then is you have to have your vet come out and put the uterus back in place. Um, this can also happen, uh, you know, just, just by chance. If that calf just, you know, itself came out a little quickly, one way to help prevent this is to get that mom standing as soon as possible. Um, if it does happen, you don't necessarily um, need to call the offspring of that animal because it's not genetically related, but I would recommend calling that particular animal after you wean your calf because if she's done it once, she's likely to do it again just because things, the ligaments and everything are a little bit weaker and she's prone to have that problem in the future. Now, when we talk about issues with the calves, number one issue you're gonna have is dehydration. And this is beef calves or dairy calves. A lot of things can cause dehydration. Scours, um, not figuring out how to nurse. Um, mom doesn't produce any milk. Um, the, you know, the teats are too large and the little calf just can't you know, get its mouth around it and make it work. Those are all different common causes of dehydration. So keep an eye on it. A great way to test for dehydration, well, it's one thing is if you can catch that calf and that normally calm. That's a really good indicator right there. Um, but also if you wanna pinch the skin on their neck, same as if you pinch your hands and you check how long, how many seconds it takes the skin on their neck to go back flat. Okay, so the longer it takes, the more dehydrated they are. If you need to step in and intervene in case of dehydration, the most common way to do that is gonna be with a tube feeder. Now there's a lot going on, on the screen and I'm not gonna read it to you. We uh, have a whole nice one page PDF online that you can use. But the basics are that you're gonna to want to take a tube feeder and I personally like this style and you wanna lube up the tube and you wanna put it down their throat. The best way to make sure that you have it in the right location is to allow the calf to swallow it, okay? Slowly slipping it down their neck as they swallow, okay? If you're concerned about doing this and it's new to you and you're a little worried that you might drown a calf by putting it in the wrong spot, like their lungs, um, I recommend this style because you can take it apart. Okay, so see, it comes in two pieces. Have someone hold this for you with your milk in it or your electrolytes, and you can take this end of the tube, and since it's not attached to anything, there's absolutely no way you can cause any damage or drown your calf because there's no fluid attached. So you wanna go ahead and feed this in down their esophagus. Now, in order to know you got in the right spot while you're getting the hang of it, one trick I like to do is if you blow into it, okay, once you have this tube, if you blow into this tube and that calf coughs, you are in the lungs. No big deal. Back it out. Try again. All right. And if you breathe in the next time and it kind of makes a gurgling noise or you can smell the stomach contents, congratulations, you're in the right spot. It's a little harder to twist this on when you're like that. But that's what teamwork's for. Okay. One thing I will please caution against is I know it seems like it's taking a long time when you're draining these out, you're holding it and you're in a weird crouched position. Um, but please don't squeeze this. What you're gonna do is create a reverse vacuum and that fluid gonna shoot through the tube. It's gonna come back up the esophagus and it's gonna go into their larynx and down into their lungs. And you're gonna have that problem that you didn't wanna cause in the first place by getting fluid in their lungs. And if you think five minutes crouched over why this thing drains is a long time, treating that calf for hours and days if they have pneumonia, it's gonna be a heck of a lot longer. Another tip, if you guys will humor me for a minute, to make sure that you get it in the right spot is a lot of YouTube videos will tell you to tilt the calf's head back. Don't tilt the calf's head back. 
If you humor me for a second, if you tilt your head back and try to swallow, you'll notice it's actually really hard. But if you take a breath, what happens is tilting your head back opens your airway. So you're more likely to not hit the right tube, so to speak, if you tilt the calf's head back. If you keep the calf's head straight or even angled slightly down, again, if you try to swallow, it's actually very easy to swallow, but it's not as easy to breathe because you've actually kind of closed off your airway a little bit and opened up your esophagus more. So when you're tubing a calf, make sure you keep their head level slightly down when you put the tube in, okay? You're gonna do great. Couple issues that can happen to that calf when they first come out is getting them to start breathing. What I like to do is take and clean out their throat and, and their nose of any mucus. I also like to take a, like, a nice stiff piece of straw, and tickle their nose, the inside of their nose. They find it really irritating, but it'll actually get them to, you know, sputter, move their face around, get some of that fluid outside of their lungs and any mucus that's left. Also, if you're tall, unlike me, you can actually hold them up a little bit as long as their um, head is below their lungs. It'll help drain any excess fluid that's in there. And that should get them helping breathing. Um, there are situations where, um, especially if they're breech and you know they've taken in a lot of fluid where they might've drowned, where you can use artificial respiration to um, attempt to bring them back. I've only had it work um, for me once out of four tries. Um, but one way to do it is you can buy the um, a, an artificial respiration machine to claps on their nose and, and helps them breathe. They're kind of expensive. If you don't want to do that, get a garden hose. And what you do is you put it in one nostril, hold the other nostril mouth closed, and you're going to breathe in. It doesn't have to be a long strip of a garden hose. You're going to breathe in and then let the air come out. Breathe in let the air come out out of the hose. And you're gonna keep doing that until you can hopefully get that calf stimulated to get some oxygen in and breathe. You can also do stress compressions on the rib cage. Again, this is not a guarantee that it's gonna work, but um, it's something you could try. You guys have any questions? Um, if you have any questions later, you can always email me or Jeff or Sarah. Here's our contact information.